because we know that uh, investors are interested in your position in the Clearwater region of Alberta. Tell us why this, just tell us what kind of oil comes out of that region and why is there so much buzz about it right now? Sure. So, you know, Obsidian has a very large position in an area called the Peace River. Historically, we produced out of the blue sky. Um, but you've had a dynamic over the last couple of years where you've seen prolific growth out of the clear water play. Most of that you know, activity has really been focused to the southeast of us. You've seen activity um, effectively move uh, to the northwest into our neck of the woods. Um, and the reality is, is that the economics are top decile as relates to when you compare it to other plays in North America, mm -hmm. you know, very, very strong returns and, and recycle ratios. Um, we ourselves have 500 sections of land and um, we're in the early stages of a delineation process and, mm -hmm. you know, we're very constructive on our, on our prospects in that regard. Now, you, like a lot of other uh, oil companies, you're not going for huge production growth in the near term. It sounds like investors are not necessarily looking for that. BMO reckons you had production of about 31,000 uh, barrels of oil a day, equivalent a day, last year, and it sees you going to about 32,500 this year. So not massive production growth, but steady. No, I, I think that's right. I mean, 2022 was a year of, of us out, us right-sizing our production profile relative to our inventory um, position. So we grew significantly more than we're projected to grow in 2023. The reality is that we're always going to respond and react to market dynamics mm -hmm. at, at current prices with current service costs. Um, you know, we don't think it makes sense to grow much more than that. It's interesting. I know BMO says some of these Clearwater wells um, have a one-year payback if you assume $70 WTI. I think that's right. I think it's fair to say that you know a fair amount of the wells actually pay out significantly in less time than a year, even at $70. And so therein lies the attraction to the play. You um, have got approval for a buyback of your stock uh, up to about 10% of the outstanding shares. Is this your first buyback? This would be our first buyback. That is correct. Okay, but do you, you don't pay a dividend? I don't think um, that's not. Yeah, you don't. Uh, so that's not part of the mix right now. Uh, that's correct. I mean, right here, right now, what we've been kind of very upfront telegraphing is that we believe buying back our shares is is just a um, much smarter thing to do, given the discount that we trade to on whether it's a PDP metric, our own views of, of NAV value. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, we think ultimately over the intermediate to long term will be much more impactful for the residual shareholders. That's interesting. Yeah, BMO thinks you trade at about one point. Well, as of this morning, you were trading at about 1.9 times enterprise value to EBITDA. And the peers are at about 2.3 times. Just very quickly, and maybe we can pull up a one-year comparative chart. The stock did drop in early November, and it has struggled since. Why is that? Why are people um, sort of holding off from buying your shares, do you think? Yeah, look, I would say to you, you know, we did right-size our, our, our guidance in November. Also made a decision in early December to um, defer the announcement of our 2023 guidance. I think some investors potentially construed that as a negative. The reality is that we were taking um, a bit more time to assess market conditions given the volatility um, in commodities and, and really assess our capital plans and how much capital we wanted to spend and um, versus potentially committing capital to a buyback. And so mm -hmm. um, when you overlay that with underlying commodity volatility, you know, you had a dynamic where our shares traded down a bit. Um, I think what you've seen since then is a response from the board, which is to say that we're prepared to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to buy it back. Can we start off with natural gas? It's been in such a slump, uh, near uh, inflation adjusted record lows. Maybe we can put up a five year chart for natural gas. Yeah, when we met, met last time, I warned investors to sell all of their natural gas positions. We've had one of the warmest winters on average. We've got production surging. Only now do we see natural gas producers starting to say, well, we'll lay down rigs. We're going to let supply you know, fall off. But there's a mismatch for about the next year between supply growth and demand growth. 
we think that we could, if summer's normal, exit at all-time high storage levels for natural gas. So we see no no upside really from current levels meaningfully. A glutted market for the next year, potentially. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really dependent upon a build-out in LNG capacity, which is the second half 2024 theme. I'm, I'm mega bullish, natural gas. But fast forward a year from now, I just think there's more pain to come in some of these natural gas names into the shoulder season, which is a month from now when, you know, weather is too cool to require heating, it's too uh, warm to require or air, cool, air cooling, but didn't mix that up. You know what I mean? So gas, I think, will fall off. We could, we could go to zero or negative temporarily. Wow. Just because people would have nowhere to put the gas, yeah. basically. Yeah. And I, I'd really like to spend a moment or two talking about oil because I mm-hmm. feel like energy investors are just being un- inundated with so much negativity. I can really see that through social media and the emails that I'm, I'm getting. So I, mm-hmm. I, I feel like we need a, a hand-holding session for a moment or two. You know, we've had massive inventory builds in the United States. Many people who follow the data are saying the data is complete garbage. You're looking at this adjustment factor, which is basically a fudge factor for them to say we can't make the correct Style. I know you reach. Sorry, you retweeted a comment by Jan Stewart. I did. Uh, who was yeah. very critical of very the critical. data gathering. Yeah. So even even yesterday, so we use Energy Aspects, another consultant, uh, very globally respected. Their input would have had a draw uh, yesterday of seven million barrels. Instead, the DOE reported a seven point six million barrel build. So that's a fifteen million barrel delta in a single week. So I, I feel like that's feeding this negativity. We've got you know Fed speak, interest rates, you know U.S. dollar rally, fears of a recession, etc. I really want people to look out two months from now. Mm-hmm. Because right now what we have are refineries in the U.S. emerging from their lowest run rates now. Seasonally, it happens all the time. This is the worst time for oil right now. Q1 is the worst. It progressively gets better. Mm-hmm. We've got every signal out of China. And again, I was in the Middle East meeting with energy ministers. They said, watch China after the Chinese Lunar New Year. If you see no new restrictions, it's game on for reopening. We're very clearly there now. So you look at hotel bookings, air travel, uh, road congestion in major cities is higher than where it was pre-COVID levels. And in fact, global demand hit a record December of last year, Hmm. 2% higher than pre-COVID. That was with China still under lockdown. So we've got a million barrels per day of demand normalization coming from China. Mm-hmm. We've got Russia saying our production is going to be down half a million barrels per day in March. We've got this wonky data out of the DUE, which I, I don't want to go into conspiracy theories, but let's just say it's complete bogus. We've got every shale, almost every shale producer in earnings mm-hmm. so far disappointing, saying growth is going to be lower, spending is going to be higher. Mm-hmm. And so I really want people to, to tune out the noise. It's, I've made generational wealth for some of my clients by just focusing on the few key things that matter, and that is demand is going to grow this year more than people think, mm-hmm. and it's going to grow for the next 10 years. The real story is on supply challenges. Everything that we are seeing confirms that shale growth, largely speaking, is over. Hmm. OPEC is out of spare capacity, and the global super, super majors are in a multi-period of stagnation. So the bull market thesis is very much alive. Oventiv, the former Encana, should I hold or sell? I would sell Oventiv. This is a name that really fails to gain traction with institutional investors. It's very popular for, with the, the U.S. hedge fund crowd, so it tends to be a little more volatile. Mm-hmm. We've been owners in the past, and I, I broke my, my rule. We were disappointed again in terms of forward-looking guidance. This is a couple of quarters ago. And so I, I think it's a bit of a value trap. There are better names where you you can pay at multiple, get a better execution, and just more confidence in inventory depth. You know, they're, they're, one of their primary assets is Permian, very lean on inventory. You go for lean on inventory, it's more and more lean on Canada. So I'd rather buy a Canadian name where I can have a bit more confidence in execution. U.S. oil stocks recommendations. Are there any U.S. oil stocks you prefer? We only hold one. So in my flagship fund, we own about 12 holdings, one of which is a U.S. name called Cord. So it's a U.S. pure play Bakken player. What's the symbol again? So C-H-R-D. C-H-R-D, okay. Yeah. So it's been uh, a consolidator. I, I think it could consolidate some of the Canadian Bakken uh, guys who are unable to consolidate themselves. Mm-hmm. We have Cord trading at 1.8 times uh, cash flow at $100 oil, 2.4 times at 80. So if you even even if you believe in the current oil price, and that's a big theme here. Mm-hmm. People are panicking. Oh my God, we're only at 75 during the weakest period of the year right now for demand with refineries down, China just emerging, etc. We we all have to just take a deep breath. My average holding, I think, is discounting an oil price of $57. So 75 may seem bad. We're not quite at 100 just yet. Hmm. But the re-rate potential to go from 57 to where we are now, let alone where I think we're likely to be. So we see core trading at a 19% free cash flow yield at 80, a 30% free cash flow yield at 100. Importantly, they've pledged to return at least 
75% of that free cash flow back to us, mm -hmm. primarily in the form of buybacks, base and, and variable dividends as well. So that's the only U.S. name that we, okay. we own right now. But I thanks. got the question. So yeah. when is Baytex going to better represent what fundamental value is, which we think is closer to $20 a share versus six today? We have a new CEO. So he's been hitting the street. Uh, people have been getting to know him, strategy, et cetera. So they're underpinned by a non-op Eagleford position. I think they're looking to expand their Eagleford position to become an operator, so get a technical team there. That way they can increase production in that area, which has been in decline. We have exposure to their Clearwater acreage. They have now drilled the top 15 of the best 15 wells in the most economic play in North America, so in the Clearwater, so awesome results there. The conventional heavy production, which is wonderfully economic, we have the differential for Canadian heavy now hitting the lowest level since May, about 17 bucks, so we would have been in the mid-20s when we last met. So what we see is the continuation of paying down debt. We have them reaching their target of debt by Q2, so next quarter, to allow for 50% of free cash flow to come back to us. So as we look to next year in a $15 differential world for Canadian heavy oil, between 80 and 100, we've got them at a 25 to 47% free cash flow yield, i.e. we think we'll get a 12 to, let's say, 23% either dividend yield or they'll buy back almost a quarter of their stock next year. And it's that action of meaningfully buying back stock that mm -hmm. we think will eventually drive re-rating. We have got it at 1.4 times. That's at 100, two times at 80. We see this as profoundly mispriced, but you're, you're right. Money has not yet got down into the, the small, mm -hmm. small guys, small mids. That's what we own. So we're Baytex's largest shareholder. We're happy to be. We're going to be mm -hmm. patient. Let the new CEO execute on a strategy. There are very few institutions left that can buy not just mid caps, which is really what my, my uh, majority of my holdings are, but the small guys. And so when you look at a gear with a market cap of, of uh, $270 million, there's very few institutions. Institutions. And so it is a retail name, which is perfectly fine. It's paying mm -hmm. a very healthy dividend. We have at $90 oil this year, their, their, their dividend is, is easily uh, covered. So they're paying, we've got a 12 cents per share. So that's about 11 and a half ish percent yield. Mm -hmm. We have that as sustainable. That clearly hasn't been enough to incentivize greater funds flow. My belief is in the next couple of months, we're going to have oil appreciate once China demand normalizes. People start panicking about a recession. People start seeing that there's a, a, a chronic supply challenge. We have people that, whom I respect calling for $100 oil by the summertime. That's, I'm, kind of, I'm saying by year end to give myself uh, a little uh, uh, more rope. But we see very strong oil prices. It will bring back funds flow. It will start with the large guys and eventually move its way uh, down. Gear might be a little too small for most institutions to care. But if you're a retail investor, you're going to go buy five or 10,000 bucks. You want it for the dividend. It's, it's a decent way to play. White cap. I own it. I, I think it's a very solid name. It, it was interesting. I was chatting with my analyst this morning. So a few metrics that we look at is how many years of reserves do they have? So of, it's called PDP, Proved Developed Producing. So those are wells that are on stream. So they have six years of PDP reserves. It's trading at three times using the reserve engineer's deck. So it's, it's, it's you know, you're getting 50, you're only paying for 50% of the value of the production stream of wells already on stream if you believe in an oil price basically where we're trading today. So it's just another example of just how profoundly mispriced the sector is. We've got them hitting their final leverage metric uh, next quarter, so Q2, where they've announced we'll be getting 75% of the free cash flow. They'll be increasing their dividend to a 7.2% a yield. That's only using about 42% of their total free cash flow. So there's plenty of room for them to their increase their dividend, pay a variable, or more importantly, uh, given the profound discount, to do a meaningful share buyback. We hope, we're hopeful that they'll buy at least 10% of their company this year while paying a very meaningful dividend. We think, uh, given that it's trading at two and a half times at 100, 3.1 times at um, 80, we think fair value is five times, so that's about a $22 share price, hmm. which is 115% upside from here. More than a double, yeah. Yeah, May continues to be our largest holding now. It's probably about a 10.5 to 11% weighting of, of my fund. We are bullish heavy oil. The best way to express that view is in MEG Energy. You're getting 35 years of reserves. If I'm right at $100 oil, and frankly, even if I'm not at, at 80, at $80 oil, they could privatize themselves with five years of free cash flow. At 100, they could do it in three. So at, at worst, you're getting 30 years of reserves, i.e. free cash flow for free. Because it's oil sounds. Yeah, and at $80 oil, they'll free cash flow a billion dollars per year. And so the, what's the value of the last share if they actually go ahead with that and able to buy themselves at the current oil price? Well, the last share price is worth $30 billion, and it's a $21, $22 share price today. And so they have publicly said, we are going to pay you 50% of free cash flow now 
100% we have about by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So when I look 2024, and yeah, we got to wait a year for 100% of free cash flow, but they've told you, we're going to basically keep production, you know, they're going to ramp it just a little because they're, they're going after a better part of their um, of the ore with lower water saturation, whatever. So they can re increase production very, very meaningfully. Meaningfully drop down debt. And next year, they're trading at a 31% free cash flow yield. And they've told you, if you don't see the value in our shares, we do. Hmm. So in terms of fair value mm -hmm. in, a, in a multi year bull market for oil, we think a six multiple, which is a 12% free cash flow yield, i.e., 12% potential dividend yield, is a good starting base for a conversation for fair value. And that's a $47, $48 share price. Nice. Yeah, I, I got to say, of, of all of the names in Canada, like I own every name in Canada that I want to own. We've got a list of names that are you know, on our radar in terms of, okay, should we own it, should we not? And the mm -hmm. question that I ask my, my, my team of sales guys is, okay, what do we not own today that we need to? We're, mm -hmm. we're, if you believe with every fiber in your being that we're heading to $100 oil, what do we need to own? Where can we make the most amount of upside? Crescent Point is, is on that list because it screens incredibly well. You know, it's, it's trading on our math at 2.4 times cash flow at 80 this year, assuming they, they demonstrate with an ongoing buyback the current oil price that compresses mm -hmm. to 1.9 times. You believe in 100 with the buyback, it's 1.4 times. It's, it's radically mispriced on that metric. Mm -hmm. What's holding us back is the perception or the reality that they don't have enough inventory and therefore they're going to have to be using their free cash flow, which I want, and instead to use that for m and to add to their inventory depth. And so to me, that's the stumbling block. They've got to prove to me in the world that inventory is adequate. I can believe in the free cash deal that I'm seeing because mm -hmm. I, I see 37% this year and 45 and 100. So that it's, it's crazy. But I don't believe those numbers. So, you know, I checked with Peter. So you, you, you feel the inventory is not as long lived? Yeah. Or? So my, my yeah. rule of thumb is I want 10 years. You know, I referenced Meg this morning. They've got 35. So if I've got 35 years, I know they don't have to do anything to replenish that inventory. Mm -hmm. If you have under 10, to me, that's, that's the line in the sand where I start to get nervous. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you've got to do something. You've got to go acquire. You've got to do a rank exports. You've got to do something to increase that, reserve, that inventory. Because again, my math is, okay, how many years would it take to privatize? How many years of stay flight inventory do you have? Deduct the two. That's how many years of free cash flow I'm getting for free. What's it worth? And so for Crescent Point, it's similar to, like to a Vermillion. So I would have guys tell me, well, Vermillion, they only have six years. Well, that's, that's an issue. They're going to have to be active through M&A. Mm -hmm. So I think for Crescent, that's my biggest stumbling block. If I got convinced that inventory depth is adequate, Yeah, the stock is clearly mispriced. Yeah, so we've had the WCS differential fall from the mid-20s to $17 this morning. That's the lowest level since about May of mm -hmm. last year. Oh, you see quite a rally there in our chart as Massive. well. Yeah, yeah. So few people could explain why we went into the mid-20s. Like we had a pipeline outage. We had China basically, there was a buyer strike of heavy oil as they were still under COVID zero. We have names like a Meg that said, you know, they hadn't been sending any shipments. They only just started mm -hmm. in December to send the first shipment to China. High natural gas prices in Europe meant that it was more expensive to use heavy oil in their refineries. Yep. Natural gas prices have fallen 60-70%. So there's a lot of reasons. It, this was not a takeaway issue. It was a short-term demand issue for heavy oil. To me, $17 WCS differentials tells me China is back. And that's hugely important, not just for WTI, but for WCS. So I look at Canada. We're building out TMX. Line fill should be Q4 of this year. Another 500,000 barrels, 550, 100,000 barrels per day of excess capacity, customer diversification. We've got a, a very important refinery coming online in Mexico, where rather than sending heavy oil to the Gulf Coast, they're going to consume it. So bad for refiners, great for WCS. So if you're bullish on oil, and on, I honestly don't understand over the medium term how you can't be, the best way to express that view is in buying WCS, Canadian heavy oil producers, because you're getting the longest reserve life of anywhere that I can find in the world, mm -hmm. the strongest balance sheets of anywhere in the world, the lowest decline rates of anywhere in the, in the world, and everybody is committed to return 75 to 100% of that free cash flow back to us in the next two-ish quarters, two to three quarters from now. And you can look at it, like, okay, 30% free cash yields. Will the name stay trading at a 30% dividend yield? My premise would be no, it's going to get mm -hmm. re-rated to 10 to 12. So you can see that identifiable catalyst and it's coming and you can triangulate in terms of when that's going to be occurring. So that's the reason why our fund is about 75% exposed to Canadian heavy oil. So if I'm on a 30% cash flow yield, why don't I just jack up my dividend to a 30% it's yield? Com it's coming. It's coming. It has to be. So companies like us, I'll use a Synovus, has said, okay, we're going to pay out 100% of free cash flow. Well, we have that happening Q3 of this year. It's 50, now it's going to 100. So we can look at the, the math and say, okay, well, Synovus is trading at a 
29% free cash to yield next year to $100 oil and $15 WCS differentials. So for them, I think for them it would be a 10% buyback and a 20% dividend. Mm-hmm. I don't want to steal thunder from later on in the show, but mm-hmm. will the name stay trading at a level where I can get a 20% dividend and a 10% buyback when I've got 30 years of reserves mm-hmm. and it's not, this isn't a forecast. The company's told us that that's going to be occurring. So that's, that's what excites me. And for, so pe- for people that are feeling drowning in the bearishness of the moment, this too is going to pass just like it did in 2020. And there, there's a fortune to be made in that fear. A former boss of Imperial yes. Oil taking over. Yeah, so you... you an outsider, so that's that's good. So what's been plaguing Suncor? We've said in the past to get the stock working again, they have to stop killing people. You know, they've, 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 the, the health and safety, the biggest issue, everyone knows that it's what they're focusing on. Yeah. They also have asset issues with 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 base mine. You're being it, very. I mean, they didn't kill anyone. No, they people, have tragic okay, people, Several people, yeah. several people died in yeah, operations. Five so, fatalities, so, I believe, since that, 2010. That's yeah, all. That's yeah. all. So yeah. okay. So we're to tell you want, but they've got they do have a health and safety challenge, with, mm-hmm. which they acknowledge and they're, they're working on. Yes. That's plaguing the stock on the, the basis of if you can overlook that. Also, mine base mine uh, exhaustion is an issue. So they're working on that. They've addressed that on, on the call where they're, they're deg- the one mine is exhausting. They've got to fill the upgraders with with either expansions or new development. I thought the oil sands never ran out. No, no, not at all. So you've, you've got to move around. That's interesting. Yeah, so I've, yeah. I've talked to people that are in, in, intimately um, familiar with the assets. They think it's about a four to five year turnaround to get the, the mothership moving in the right direction. With that said, if you look at just the metrics, if you're a bull on oil, and no doubt their downstream, their refiners are unbelievable. So that's a major, major crown jewel for them. We've got them at a 31% free cash yield at 100, 23 at 80. And so you, you do wonder, warts and all, is that being discounted into the share price today? And what kind of upside would you see? Mm. If you were to assume that Kruger is successful in riding the ship, we think there's more than a double in the stock price. You're not buying at this stage, it sounds like, Eric. I have no comment on that. No comment? Okay. Okay, okay.